Welcome back to another episode of the Sports Medicine Project, episode 73 we've got for you today. Will it actually be 73 when it comes out? Yeah, it'll be 73. Yeah. We're pre-recording a few here. Yeah. So, need to get the order right. Maybe introduce me or something like that. Oh, I'm here with my usual co-host, Blake Withers, Dr. Blake Withers, some may say. Why would they say doctor? Because <laughs> I noticed on our like money paperwork the other day that you wrote doctor because you can. On oh, what money? Oh, yeah, like yeah. Bank loan thing. Yeah, I don't know about that because health professionals. I remember when I went through uni, learning about health professionals getting a bit more from the bank, a bit more from the <laughs> loan people, that kind of thing, but. It hasn't seen... Oh, airplane tickets. I remember someone telling me. Oh. And every time I check something, I would never say it in public. It's not on any of my statements. But if it's something like that, when it's going Maybe to... Maybe I should start putting doctor on our flights. Yeah, well, that's what it is. But then... Really it, try and get that exit aisle for the leg room. Yeah, if somebody needs a doctor, all I can do is debride a wound. You know, I have to have all my equipment. It has to be sterile. So I'm not going to be very, very doctoring at all. But I do remember hearing that. It hasn't happened. I mean... We haven't been denied anything, so maybe it could be working. I reckon it's good on, like, a rental application. I feel like people would buy into that. I don't think you can do Dr. Hey. Dietary is a weird one. But I've actually read... I've also read that anyone can call themselves a doctor. It's not a protected title. Really? Yeah. So you can be a doctor of philosophy, which is... I think that is the number one. Like, that is a real... I say real, but that is the, the title. And then below that is the doctor, like, the medical doctor... Apparently, I think mm. I don't know. I don't really buy my team to it. I remember when I very first started practicing, I did. I was like, "Fuck, this person's a doctor. They must be incredible." And they usually are pretty nice people, but it certainly doesn't. But I think you're a good clinician or not. No, but I think if you're an outsider looking in and you see the title doctor, you're gonna be like, "Oh, this person." Yeah. They well, definitely do have a place in the hierarchy. Yeah. The issue in podiatry was that people. And it states this in the regulations that you have to, if you perceive yourself to the public as being a doctor, you have to somehow within whichever way you convey that, show them that you're a uh, podiatrist or not a medical doctor. So it's like, say if you had a sign, it would say, Dr. Blake with his podiatrist foot and ankle or something like that, right. I think. But again, that may have changed. I don't know, I'm just hearing this secondhand information. It could be completely wrong. But I do know of podiatrists that call themselves doctors. Mm. I think in the right situation, why not? Like yeah. on our bank forms to try and get a bank loan. Yeah, that's true. I, <laughs> I went to, through uni with a guy and he now does aged care. And he has a doctor in front of his name on his Instagram bio. So, aged care is a tough job. Mm. He's a podiatrist. <laughs> yeah, I reckon it'd be tough. It, and then on your Instagram bio as well. I mean, I guess it doesn't matter what kind of work you do, but in your Instagram bio, like, I can't see any other reason why... I feel why. like it's a bit degrading to the doctors that really, like, yeah. worked for it. And you don't want to judge, but you think if someone has doctor in their bio... Oh, I don't know. We're getting into... I don't want to get cancelled. Yeah, we're getting into murky but territory if, here. If you have it in there because you want to maybe draw people to your page, because you automatically think, oh, doctor, they, I want to see what their information they share. So maybe it gets more people in. Mm. But then I also think... And I guess it, let's separate it to a page versus your personal page. If it's on your like personal personal with its friends and family and people you went to school with and stuff, I'm like, oh, I don't know why you would do that. Yeah, I'd feel a bit like fraud. Yeah. <laughs> Personally. Like, what's the real reason you want people to perceive you as a doctor when you yeah. really know that you're not? I don't mm. know. I don't know. I used to feel like that as a podiatrist when you cut nails and, and skin. Mm. You're like, oh, it's really a bit, a bit degrading. But now it's, I don't feel like that at all. Mm. Yeah, so if you're a podiatrist listening to this, don't feel degraded by that at all. I guess what would be the same in physio, doing massage. People just think you're a massage therapist. Yeah, I guess so. That? Was there anything that was degrading as a young physio or a physio student? Mm, nothing that personally bothered me that I can think of. Yeah. yeah. Uh, maybe. Yeah, anyway. Mm. So, this episode, we've already gotten off track. Mm. 
We went this weekend down to Melbourne, Blake last and I, weekend. last weekend, yeah. down to Melbourne for Dr. Richard Willey's running course. Yeah, real doctor, by the way. Yeah, real doctor, doctor speaking of. Yeah. <laughs> he yeah. worked for it. Um, on restoring load capacity for the runner. So it was all about the principles of bone and tendon and muscle rehab and why we do what we do, running retraining, yeah. running programming, programming yeah. for performance, um, strength and conditioning principles. Yeah. And it was great. Yeah. Best course I've ever done, I reckon, mm. hands down. Yeah. You've been to a, could you, you've been to Christian Barton's running course before? Yep. And I've, I've done quite a few courses and... Running specific? Running specific, I've done one, Christian Barton's, yeah, and then, now this one. Yeah, which he yeah. was there as well. Was in, yeah, in he was there place. too. He works there, and Peter Valliaris works there. Mm. And that was he also a fantastic time. course, I must say. I think I'm in a better position now to absorb the information because I'm seeing and treating a lot more runners now. Mm. So everything feels a lot more relevant and I can apply it straight away because mm. I just have a lot more of that demographic on in my in my diary now. So yeah. And also I've seen a lot more cases now being out for 5 years. So everything that Rich was talking about, I could relate that back to cases that I've seen and reflect on what I might have done differently or what yeah. I am happy that I did as I did. So it was really good. What was what was your thoughts on it? Uh, I wanted to kind of divide it into two, like just the pure presentation, visual side, and get your thoughts on that, and then we'll jump into the content. So we're just going to basically go through, we're not going to tell you everything that was in the course, but just a couple of points that we took and just kind of hash out. Like our them. highlights. Yeah, just a really, like as an example, older people tend to have more plantar flexion injuries and I thought maybe that could be why podiatrists tend to see the older population because it's more oh, injuries in the foot and the ankle or structure is important for bones. The bigger the bone, the better. And perhaps that's why females because they have smaller bones. Mm. But anyway, I... Yeah, it was it was really good. Great to meet him. As yeah, well, from, from so overseas. good. Yeah, yeah, and if you guys haven't um, listened to Rich Willie's podcast with us, then yep. jump back a f- quite a few episodes ago now, maybe like twenty or so. <sighs> Do you no, think? No, it's like seven. Oh, really? Yeah. It felt like a while ago. <laughs> um, and we, yeah, we recorded a podcast with Ritually. It was in December, I think, last year. So that's who we spent the weekend with and who we learned from. Yeah. Yeah, it was awesome. On yeah, we did that podcast on bone stress injuries, which were good, which he talked a lot about in this course. But it's always interesting. His Instagram, by the way, is Montana Running Lab, and he does a lot of research over there in lots of things like cadence, ITB, patellofemoral pain, bone stress injuries, Achilles. And he works with a lot of people from Australia, like uh, Christian Bartman and Peter Maliaris. And so have you. But uh, yeah, it's always interesting seeing someone present that you've followed for a long time online and spoken to on a podcast it just shows me how important the in-person events and courses are i mean Mm. certainly even listening to this podcast and listening to the guests that we have on you get some good information i'm definitely certain of that but you only get so much and you can't sit here and listen for four hours like we Mm. went to that course for eight hours each day you couldn't sit there and listen to a podcast for that long and no. have it that engaging. Whereas in the course, there's someone that's really knowledgeable presenting to you. They've got great slides. There's people around you. People are asking questions. It's so much more engaging. Yeah. I guess the challenge is just finding the right course to go to. Yeah, I totally yeah. agree. And I I mean, and t- we went to Greg Lehman's course a, a couple of months ago. But prior to that, I hadn't done a face-to-face course in a while because of yeah. COVID and they weren't really yeah. running. And it made me realize how important it is to get to face-to-face courses I, yeah. I i always have some sort of online course going all the time yeah but man i get distracted easily doing those things yeah and i think rich said he's got a running online course come out and no conflict of interest we paid full price yeah yeah this for the is course, our flights <laughs> yeah we didn't get anything like that we really just wanted to to go and learn and this is beneficial for us. Like this is almost a, a reflection yeah. activity for Blake and I just to yeah. cement a lot of the learnings that we that we had and we thought that may as well record it so that we can share it to everyone else. Yeah, I think that's a big problem with courses. And now I find that a lot because I, I read a lot. I try to journal a lot. I listen to a lot of podcasts and audio books. 
and you and I've tried that before and I was speaking with Ethan oh, two hours ago I gave him a, a book and we were just talking about how we take down the information and I've tried in the past where you listen to something take in some information translate it in your mind synthesize it to come out in a drive or on Google Drive into a document and you never look at it again Mm. So with this, hopefully this will be something where we can cement it in our mind mm. and go over it again. But I don't know how to address that with courses. Because you go and you write all this and you're like, fuck, this is awesome. That's really cool. But I'm looking back on this now and I'm like, fuck, I forgot that I wrote that down. That's really cool. So I think I'm- one way to help with that and something that we do it in our clinic is after someone's been to a course, typically what we'll do is present. So we have PD every week. Yeah. And so typically we'll one of us will present on what we learnt during the course. So then you've got to synthesise it, you've got to write it down and then you present it back to the other physios that didn't go to the course. What about the people that you're presenting it to? How do they take it in? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's a big one. So like yeah. how do you get information in? And you just imagine a funnel of taking information in, do whatever you've got to do it in your mind and then getting it out to then translate I think it's just repetition like the more you do it the more you talk about it the more you see it it becomes a bit yeah it's hard I mean it takes time you can see why it's why it's hard for for people unless you've got the time to do it and everyone has things that get in the way I wanted to give the people listening some advice with these courses is always take the day off after if you've got the ability to Mm. just because you usually work Monday to Friday you're on the weekend you're learning Sometimes you don't sleep as well if you're somewhere else and you might get up early and train and, Mm. yeah, you're pretty fatigued. And I would always advise to take that that extra day. I've made that mistake. You're pretty good at it. You do that pretty well. We didn't do it this time and we were pretty tired yesterday. Yeah, we were pretty pretty buggered. Yeah, yeah. I agree though. I think that is good advice. It's about balance and minimizing burnout. Yeah. Now, what did you think of the, the visuals? Not the content at all? Yeah. Just the presentation itself. I mean, to be honest, this isn't something that I'm actively thinking about during the course. But now that you mention it, I think that the slides were like everything was engaging. There wasn't a huge amount of writing that made like made you feel like you had to read the whole time. Mm. That's as deep as I go. What, what, why, what did you think? I've, those were the best. And I've we've both been to a lot of these courses and we've both presented a lot. Those slides were the, the, the most, I could read them so easily from wherever I was in the room. Like the colors really match really well. So mm-hmm. it was black, white, with the colors around and they were so simple but the information on them very succinct yeah and it was so simple but made so much sense Mm. as an example like one thing you know structure is important for bones the bigger the better and then a statistic something like for every five percent in diameter you know something Mm. in bone strength Mm -hmm. i honestly wanted to take a picture of every single slide because i was like this is really really good or it was a really good summary of the paper and i haven't seen that that before and I remember some, I went to a sports medicine, uh, sports medicine Australia conference. And it's just lots of information and it's some good information, but it's like you, you have to work out what's good and what's not. Whereas yeah. on the, like, great, there's only this. So I don't even have to decide. Whatever it is, you take it in. So, uh, yeah, I've got to applaud you for that. That was really, really cool. And it almost, it probably allows you to write down more <laughs> things that you find particularly relevant and that yeah. sticks with you. Yeah which I think is important because I find writing things down also is a way for me to remember. Yeah. I printed out all the slides as well. That was my way of trying to yeah. learn. And then I wrote yeah. all over the, the slides. I yeah. didn't do that in uni, but yeah, I wish I did. Right. I reckon that was a good good move. Yeah. Cool. Well, you want to? I want to start off with one. That's another one I just fucking forgot about. He mentioned and talked about insertional Achilles. Mm. And perhaps one of the reasons why that may take a little bit longer than mid-portion is the time it takes to get into dorsiflexion is longer, usually because that's irritable for them mm. in the early stages, so they avoid that. And the problem with that is because when you get into that degree of ankle dorsiflexion is when you put the most force in through that Achilles, which mm. is what it needs to get stronger and more resilient. I thought that was freaking awesome because you see that clinically where it, it can be a bit of a bugger. Not, not really, actually. It just takes a long time. Yeah. It's pretty simple and follows that logical 
trajectory. But yeah, I thought that was pretty cool. What do you think about that? Did yeah. You, did you know that? Have you heard that before? No, I haven't. And I think that that, I mean, that makes, that makes sense. I mean, a lot of the strength and conditioning principles, I think, were, were good to sort of rehash and understand why particular parameters are so relevant for managing these injuries. Oh, that's such a broad statement. No, no, I was going to, I'm just, coming around? yeah, I'm coming around. Yeah. Just hear me out. So the, one of the main things that I sort of took away from everything was, which we kind of knew, like tendons and bone. Well, I didn't actually know that tendons get bored quickly, but bones get bored quickly or they get somewhat numb to, to loading cycles and tendons are Mechan- much the same. Mechanosensitivity is what they lose, is the official term for it. Yeah. And so obviously things need to be loaded for their capacity to tolerate load to improve and to be able to get to those higher loads involved in, in running. After about... 60 or over 60 repetitions both tendon and bone seem to get bored and then you lose that effect of the stimulus so whether it be jumping whether it be squats whether it be calf raises if you're exceeding that rep range then you're I guess losing the impact of of the session and and the other thing with that is that tendons, both tendons and bones, they, they thrive under heavy load. So things need to be at a high intensity to have the best impact on these structures. And so that's why we're so encouraging of, of really pushing, you know, heavy resistance. And of course, that's Blake and mine, my, our bias. So, you know, everything that Rich was saying was very much in line with, with our biases. Um, but it, I guess it shows that what we're doing is on the right track which is positive um and then through with that as well so muscle i guess there's the continuum or the um the sort of chain so muscle is the thing that contracts which has an impact on bone which has an impact on tendons which has an impact on cartilage so all of those structures that are typically injured they work together they're not separate so you need to have high load for the muscle to get stronger and you need that f- to, to pull on the bone for the bone to get stronger. The tendon, the muscle contracts, pulls on the tendon, which pulls on the bone, which all gets stronger together. Um, the best way to get your muscle stronger as well is to be working through full range of motion. So you want to be, like what Blake was saying, dipping down into dorsiflexion for a calf raise is going to apply the most amount of strain to the tendon, to the muscle, and then have the... The Achilles. The tendon, yeah. yeah. And therefore have the the most prominent impact. Yeah, does that change much of your, your clinical practice? I would think that it means that you do less overall volume in one session, still keep it heavy, keep it challenging, but perhaps doing multiple sessions a day. And if we're talking about, because this was for the runner, but of course we're always thinking, how does this relate to the general population and taking some of the principles from there? Mm. And I guess that could mean, you know, your Achilles patients or your tendon patients, you're loading them in the morning and you're loading them in the afternoon with smaller, more frequent sessions. Yeah, and heavier. Yeah, yeah. do you do that typically? I do that a lot at the moment. In the early stages when I'm trying to, to really, whether it be instill the habit of doing something or I just want them to move the tendon because it's sore, just really small, frequent sessions, less likely to flare it up. They're usually a little bit more likely to be compliant because we're only, in, and we try and time the session. Sometimes it's between five to seven minutes. I'm like, great, do this in the morning, afternoon, whether it be every second day or even every day. But if we're now following those same principles, then getting them to do it heavy, that might be still really beneficial for them anyway as well. Mm, yeah. One of the things that's definitely changed for me is I, I always sort of had the mentality of when you're rehabbing an injury, do the strength stuff before a run. If you're doing like a run and a strength session on the same day, mm. do the strength stuff before the run because that's the priority. If you're uninjured, then more of the running is the priority because that's your sport. It's more specific. But now hearing everything about exactly that, so tendon and bones aren't going to adapt as well unless it's in that first 60 sort of loading cycles, then my, my thoughts around that have definitely changed. I think that the strength work needs to be completed first. 
because I think you're trying to have a more solid impact on the the tissues during that session whereas the running is probably more beneficial just from a um, fatigue resistance and cardiovascular standpoint and still having some impact on the the tissues as well it's not great like running is not great for bone but not as definitely not as much as the the strengths but i guess and i I, that's such a throwaway line i'm trying not to do that like it's not great for increasing the perhaps it's good for increasing maybe the resiliency to running but yeah what is it not but you're not it's not it's not helping the it's not going to be impacting the tissues in the way that yeah, heavy, heavy resistance training, training or plyometrics will yeah okay so i should say it's not great when compared to this yeah so trying to only make like a dogma say we're like yeah running's not good for tendons whereas it does something to tendons it may increase the resiliency yeah. for whatever sport but yeah and and like plyometrics is something that we will definitely be including more of during our strength programs after that course as well i've always tended to do more sort of like low rep more power-based exercises in my strength programs for runners like box jumps and broad jumps but i'm going to change that now and do more of that energy storage and release like hop like yeah yeah. so like hopping and jumping over hurdles or continuous jumping or hopping things like that is going to be more impactful by the seams of things and if you went for a run fresh that is a plyometric activity. So the first 60 loading cycles of that run are going to have a similar effect as if you were to do those plyometrics that we were just speaking of. So it's not that it's not going to waste when you're doing it on your own. Yeah. Yeah. It's not that it's going to waste when you're doing it on, on its own. However, I, the, the loading stimulus that you get from the strength and conditioning work is superior to the loading that you're getting with running because it's working towards closer towards that 90% of your 1RM, which is the load that you need to be at for to have the sort of best impact on bone. And so, stiffness, which would be in the below the knee, just anything that increases the plantar flexion forces. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, like they looked at uh, one of the studies that that Rich mentioned was heavy squatting in young female athletes, and they did um, four sets of three to five repetitions at 85 to 90 percent of one RM over over three weeks, and they had improvements in their lumbar spine and femoral neck bone density, and then there was another study that he that he was talking about that looked at um, more higher rep ranges and their the impact was negligible i don't think it actually had any impact on tendon or bone or whatever it was looking at i actually can't find it right now so i can't i wanted to go back to what you said about the 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 power that the muscle produces or sorry the force that the muscle produces to act on the tendon Mm -hmm. that creates a really high stimulus to the tendon to then adapt and you get that in a the highest degree of dorsiflexion so one of the things that he said which is a big shock for me because i give that to a lot of people and while it does have some effect it's not going to be as effective as being in that that low level sorry that high level of dorsiflexion but giving people toe walking Mm -hmm. because the tendon itself is shortened the muscles contracting but it's not a great stimulus for tendon to be able to then adapt and become more resilient and get stiffer and stronger mm. yeah so i i give that to a lot of people and i'm not going to do that as much anymore because it and the reason i was doing it is because i thought something was happening that is not happening mm. and also with that movement if you relate that to running there's not much well, time more, that you're spending in that position rehab. i was just yeah. like just another exercise selection just yeah. heavy, heavy toe walking but it's not a great stimulus for the tendon because mm-hmm. it's not in that low low zone so yeah i don't know what i could i could just substitute it for more or more calf raises off a step yeah more single leg stuff one thing you, you did say as well and he had this awesome graph and i think he's actually got it on his instagram and a lot of the stuff we're talking about is on his instagram mm. but that was really cool about the the plantar flexion forces being the highest with the lateral jump side to side 
and we were talking about that kind of being the special test for someone to be able to get back. So if you want to test their Achilles capacity or really their foot and ankle capacity, that should be the test they should be able to do. And I like to get people at the start and get them to do something that they probably may not be able to do due to pain or function or some degree of disability and show them that this is where we want to try and get to. And I think this is a good benchmark. And in my mind, I'm thinking, you know, we don't have to get there and I'm not like it's black or white, but it's good for them to think about where they need to be. And then I just explain like a ladder of, great, we can do a single leg calf raise at the moment. We can't hop or jump because it's sore or irritable, but that's where we want to get to. So mm. <clears throat> I find that sometimes they come back and because we've gone through that, they've almost self-progressed. Yeah. So they're like, yeah, we were talking about calf raises, but I know you said that's where we're trying to get to. So I just did some hopping and it felt okay because you told me kind of how it should feel and how it should feel the next day. And yeah, it's pretty cool because they're mm. usually a lot, when you see them, they probably could have progressed quicker, but they're waiting to see you. So you give them a little bit of the, the lead and they can go for it, which is really cool. It means they get better quicker. Yeah, in, in a tendon, I think that that's okay. Maybe not in a bone, though. You don't want someone to sort of self-progress too quickly if you're managing a bone injury. In the rehab? Mm. Why not? not? What if you've taught them how to think about it? The parameters are not the same, but you just teach them the parameters to think about. If someone has no pain and they can hop, should they be able to do it? If you've taught them how to think about it? I guess it depends on what stage you're up to. If you're in the rest it stage and you're not doing any impact stuff yet then i would say that you probably want to be maximizing that time in the resting so after that is which would be a stress fracture or a stress reaction there's a period of time where you're not where you're not walk like loading like running sorry or jumping or heavy loading it so you're just telling them to so you if they can do a if they've had a stress reaction and it's in the first six weeks and they're doing a double leg body leg calf raise and they do a single leg and they don't have any pain and it feels fine, you don't want them to progress on their own. Uh, no, that's okay. If I mean, it depends what we're talking about, what Let's particular say a, injury. A, a tibial stress reaction. I would say that that's okay around their symptoms, but you wouldn't want them to progress to hopping. What if they can hop with no... What if they... They hop and they've got no I don't think or... they should be self-progressing in that injury. I feel like there's it's too risky to try and self-progress during a bone stress injury. I feel like that's an injury that needs more guidance. Hmm. Okay, but every other injury? Yeah, I think the risk of it going wrong is lower. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just thinking what, what would be... Yeah. I mean, I guess if you sat there, if you don't progress them to, mm, I don't know. It makes, I, I think I know what you're, what you're saying. I'm just wondering. It's if, almost like you, mm. you know, when you make the decision initially to either send them for a scan or let them go, the risk of missing it is too high. So you send them for a scan to be careful. Same thing, I think, during rehab, the risk of it flaring up or not recovering as well as it needs to or as quickly as it needs to it's too high so How? i don't think it's that high depends what kind of injury yeah. i think it depends what kind of bone stress injury Do you know i don't know if there's a, a is there a benefit to push like to rushing it though yeah, i mean it's you get better quicker because if you're closer to the if you're closer to the ceiling of what they can tolerate and there'll be a window for that, of course, where let's say. But if you give them in, like if you give them an inch, then these and how, these are the, pe- the type of people that typically that, get a that. bone stress injury. Though think of the type of people that will often get them. It's the high level runners who have a huge training volume who want to typically get back to running quickly. Typically, that is the correct. It's not. Then okay, then let's talk about something else then, because mm. let's just agree to disagree. Yeah. You can go I'll, give all your bone stress injuries fractures. I'm going to keep it more conservative. Yeah, be cool. I wouldn't give them, them fractures. I just think that you could, if there was the next level and showing them what they need to get to, of course you would have the parameters to say, don't progress you know, to hopping. We're still in the acute phase. Yeah. Isn't that what, we said? Is that yeah, what we said? Yeah. Yeah. I guess with bone stress injuries, you're right. I'm just thinking. I'm pure, always purely thinking of a just an Achilles tendon mm. that they can progress. Mm-hmm. 
did you think what did you think about the the discussion around running injury prediction based off gain analysis that was that was sort of in line with my current thoughts process i don't think that you can predict an injury based off someone's running and if it isn't broken then you don't necessarily need to well you don't need to fix it so if someone doesn't have pain or symptoms then you don't need to worry about changing their running gait yeah which is kind of what i've um run with for the last few years anyways mm-hmm. i think uh, the things that I mainly talk away that's going to change my practice is we rearranged our, our room actually. So our treadmill was up against a wall and we were only able to film the left side of the runner's body. We've changed our treadmill around so we can now get either side yeah. um, so that we can um, film the, the more on the symptomatic side and get a closer look at that. Because they, and something that Rich spoke about was um, perspective error, I think was the word that he used. When you're filming something not at that, the right sort of angle or in the right position. You're not filming at the level of the joint. Yeah, or over the, at the side of the the joint, at the side of the injury, then you might see something differently to what's actually happening. Um, So we've rearranged our, our clinic or our, our room and our treadmill so that we can do that more effectively. Yeah. That was actually, a lot of that was pretty similar to what I, what I already do. I mean, I think a lot of, um, a lot of in quotations, biomechanical errors typically can be addressed through increasing someone's cadence, or at least that, that that's a, a valid, uh, thing to change that's not going to shift loads around elsewhere too drastically and it just helps to modulate someone's symptoms when mm. they're recovering from an injury so I, I mean it was great I really I enjoyed looking at the the runners and and discussing it and it's always reassuring to know that you're doing the right thing um what was your thoughts one thing I wanted to say I wanted to mention that before the going heavier what that does yes the stiffness but also the neural drive was the other thing. Yeah. Yeah. Because I was like, we you know, I just did a research review on that about what happens when you train heavier. Like, what are we changing? Mm-hmm. So it seems to be stiffness and the neural drive is pretty important. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I thought it was the the cadence stuff made a lot of sense, but it was, it was a lot sim- Sorry, it was a lot more nuanced and complex than what probably we think of Short of steps, yep, that works, but how that actually happens, ways to make that happen, and by what mechanism it, it helps people, or what mechanism we think it helps people. So I thought that was was good, but cadence is a great way to help, which a lot of people know, and I think a lot of people that do running assessment, that's one of the things that they change, and for most people it works pretty well. Mm-hmm. And it, we're talking about when someone recovers, it's pretty likely the cadence is going to go back to how it was and that's not necessarily an issue or it may stay the whatever you change it to, whatever they change it to, or it may be completely different again. It doesn't matter too much. What matters is what they're doing and what's their volume and mm. I think what they what their running looks like <clears throat> once they get back to 100%. So if they've changed their cadence over three months and they're back running, then it comes to looking at their strength and also looking at their run programming, which is as simple as frequency imagine a pyramid of frequency as the bottom of the base and then above that would be time and then above that would be intensity Mm. um i'm jumping around a little well we are jumping around a little bit here and that's because this is a pretty unstructured conversation it's um but uh, this is just going back to the strength and strengthening principles that we were talking about before something that i was reflecting on personally is you know we in our clinic we have weights and barbells and racks and we tend to load people with heavy weights that's that's the way that we tend to do it and I've I've kind of questioned if if that's my bias because that's what I've got access to and what I personally in some ways enjoy doing and I think helps me opposed to something like Pilates which isn't something that I particularly enjoy and I I personally I think that there's other things that are better not to to um, trash talk Pilates at all I think there's certainly cases that people enjoy it and do well with it and and get 
better from it, often with lower back injuries and things like that. But for running, for runners in particular, based off the information that we were provided from Rich, that the intensity needs to be high, the volume needs to be low. I don't know if there is like what what do you see anything beneficial to come from Pilates in a runner? Yeah. What? Just to, to different stimulus. Depends what the Pilates is. Like if they're doing just some single leg squats and they do some pulses and, and single leg calf raises and things. I think there is there But is the some... volume is so high. Like they're often often in Pilates the repetition ranges is up around twenty, thirty repetitions. Yeah. Do you so mean in regards to injured? either. I think in the injured, yes, because nearly everything works for someone in pain and if someone's doing consistent movement i think that it mm. helps through like think habituation oh, what? maybe well yeah exposure maybe. habituation maybe exposure, yeah habituation like we were just i just did that research review where they looked at achilles rehab and when people did <clears throat> varying amounts of loads and then they got better and they looked at those loads again that they did. The loads didn't improve like that, or they didn't really look at a lot of them, but people couldn't do more single leg raises than what they could do when they had the pain at the very start, as an example. So if you did Pilates and you didn't get stronger, perhaps that doesn't really matter, but you can improve. However, superior, I think it's, it's certainly the, the higher, like you said, the higher loads and the low volume, like doing mm. a, a five sets of five heavy calf raises is going to be really good slowly and stressing your tendon and really back to like basic bottom, no, sorry, top down principles of the human body. There is a certain degree of stress that you have to have to a soft tissue for it to adapt, I think, significantly adapt. So tendon injuries don't get, as, as you just said before, tendon injuries don't get better from getting stronger though they get better from improving their stiffness and through no, neural drive they don't know that's not the case either that's what that's what greg said at the course they don't have they don't have to get stiffer right yeah but they could but they could yeah but they could i guess but, that's the impact but in, but in saying all that we don't actually know based mm. off the research it's like it could happen like with this study here that all the study that's going out in the research review it's not the fact that they did all this research and found that you didn't get stronger. There was like only a couple of studies and they didn't ever really look at it. So you come to see me with Achilles tendinopathy. I test all these things. I give you a loading program. And then at the end, I just look at if you got better. I don't actually retest what I did. So that's a lot of the case. So we don't actually really know. Mm-hmm. But it seemed logical that you would get stronger. But we just can't say that with certainty. Mm. But essentially, yeah. like, essentially when you... I mean, what we were talking about during this course as well is rep, rep ranges over 12 is mm. more in, conducive to muscle hypertrophy. So getting mm. your muscle size bigger. In terms of loading bone, like, mm. let's just take it back to bone. Yeah, in bone. terms of loading bone, I don't think Pilates can. Yeah, I agree with that. I agree with that. But yeah. Again, yeah, I agree because, and I. <laughs> it's I'm, funny too. I'm an idiot. Well, the way I explained it to patients, because when we did the podcast with him, he explained it well. I just misinterpreted. I thought that the because the it's the plantar flexion forces that stress the bone to then cause it to adapt mm-hmm. and become stronger. I thought it was still the bone. So I thought what was happening is because the plantar flexors cross over the anterior aspect of the the tibia. I thought that the plantar flexors contract and they do a posterior force and then that stresses the bone. That was still, not the traction, well, the, the, the muscle was still causing it, but what is actually happening is it's almost like a bow and arrow where you've got the tibia as the, the string and then the muscles are like the arrow that curve around and they pull and stress the bone. I think that's how it is, isn't it? I think that's what he was maybe talking about. Is that right? I don't know. I don't think I go into that much detail when I'm explaining things to my patients. I think it's a muscle contraction that pulls... Well, what are you explaining it to me? The muscle contraction pulls on the bone, which way? elicits a stimulus for the bone to adapt. Yeah, but in what way, though? Like, how does it pull on... What I'm talking about, how does it pull on the bone? I guess through bending forces, if it's heavy enough. Yeah, So, I, and I think... And I'm, 
I remember it seeing the graph of like the anterior cortex one, why mm. that's so hard, but I think that's how it... And so that's that takes it, it like that's relevant as well oh, to... I fuck that up. I, I, it is definitely the muscles contracting, creating the bending force, but I just I need to actually... So when, when you're impacting bone through jumping, it's not the... Previously, we thought it was like the impact, so landing that was having an effect on bone but we know now that it's actually the muscle contraction that is contracting well whatever muscles contracting it doesn't have to just be the plantar flexors it can be your quads too it's not the adductor jog anymore <laughs> it can be no, it can be because be. it doesn't cross the, the bone when you're jumping whatever muscles are involved to make that contraction because there's there's speed and there's maximum force contraction but i don't think the quads that's, contribute it's just the plantar flexion muscles. Do you think your quads do anything when you jump? Can you try yeah, and jump yeah, without no, bending they, your knees? They contribute to jumping, but they don't contribute to the bone. Why? Because it doesn't. The quads don't cross where the tibia is. So I'm the, not talking about the tibia. Oh, I'm talking okay. about the hip or oh, okay, the okay, okay. femur or wherever else they're c- touching to. All right, all right. <laughs> um. But it's the muscle contraction that is the thing that is eliciting a, a response within the bone, not the impact. So that's why heavy resistance training is just as effective for bone because it's the contraction. You don't need to actually leave the ground. However, bone, it's the, the rate of force development, so the speed with that contraction that is going to be more conducive to bone loading. Yeah, because the quicker, the higher force production. Yeah. Yeah. Does that answer that a little bit what was the question uh how does muscle impact bone when it's contracting yeah yeah that answer the question did cool. i ask that question yeah you were talking about the bow and arrow mm. yeah i just think it's an easy way to think about it because what and why i would explain that to people is it's certainly common knowledge that it is the impact forces like people think great if i want to help my tibias or my shin splints i'll go and run on the grass because it's less impact like that's Mm -hmm. what what people think so i think the reason i try and explain it to people is why i want you to do because i'm programming them like four sets of five calf raises Mm -hmm. four sets of 20 single leg hops and they're like oh there's a lot to it's heavy and why am I doing that? And it's also impact. Why am I doing that? And I'm like, well, and I'm managing most of the time uh, lower leg tibia. When I'm explaining, I'm like, this is why I want you to do mm. this because this is what we're trying to elicit because this is how we think that bones adapt. So yeah. I'm trying to get by it. But in saying all that, I probably don't have to do that. Yeah. That's what I try and explain it. But I know I can get a little bit... I certainly go way too far the other way than not. Yeah. I guess that's also with... I mean, previous, like 12 months ago, my shins flared up and I was like, I'm going to do uphill running because that will be yeah, lower well, impact. impact. Yeah, yeah, but that but, increases the... But it's increasing your plantar flex, flexor, fle- plantar, plantar flexor loads yeah. because you're going into dorsiflexion, which is increasing the strain on the muscle and the tendon and then therefore... On the bone. On the bone as well. Yeah. Or the periosteum or whatever it was when my shin was flared up. So... Uphill running is probably something to avoid if you're trying to minimize loads through the tibia and yeah. Yeah. What about, and it makes a lot of sense after speaking about it on the podcast with him last time, MTSS not being a a precursor for a bone stretch injury and not being Mm. on the continuum. But one thing I thought was interesting, I wrote this down was a lot of the things that are going to cause either of them will probably be the same. Would you say that? Like if you increase your training load a lot, yeah. <clears throat> in the state of relative uh, LEA, possibly, or you do a lot of intensity. And it made me think that that would still be tricky to say to someone that they're different because it doesn't mean one's going to lead to the other, but it probably would be more likely because the fact is it led to either either can lead to either either. Mm. Well, it's like Matt Clark said in our podcast last week, which I heard you screen recording today. Yeah. It's. MTSS is pretty painful and it takes a special kind of person to be able to continue training through it to end up into a stress fracture. However, tibial stress fractures 
and bone stress injuries do happen. They mm. just, but, but maybe, yeah, maybe it is a kind of different injury. Maybe the onset is quicker or something like that compared yeah. to MTSS that yeah. it starts with the periosteum. And yeah, if you kept training through it, maybe it would turn into more of a bony yeah. edema, stress reaction, stress fracture. Yeah. And maybe like a tibial stress, bone stress injury has just like a different type of onset with less of that periosteal flare up and more just going, I don't know. Yeah. You, you, what do you do for people that you suspect with, with MTSS? Because it is it's tricky. I mean, I know we'll have this discussion before. You can keep them running, but I always have in the back of my head, I'm a little concerned. Mm. I don't want it to lead to a bone stress injury. And while yes, like focal tenderness and it's really diffuse and it's manageable, but still you because it's such the consequences are so severe. Mm. Whereas if it does turn into that, it's like fuck. Now you've got six to eight weeks off. It's a real recovery phase to get back to it. Yeah, yeah. I definitely deload them from what they're currently doing. So yeah. if it if it's more of an MTSS presentation where where it seems as though like they're not getting s- progressive symptoms throughout their run. It's warming up a little bit more throughout throughout the run even, and it's vague. It's more diffuse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Then I will deload them from what they're currently by a lot doing. Mm, depends. Yeah. Maybe give them a bit of like a walk run interval type of thing. Mm. If it doesn't tolerate that, or if it changes at all, or if it isn't, yeah, if it's just not responding and. I'm at all concerned that they might be in a state of reds or low energy mm. availability, then again, there's probably no harm in scanning for it. Yeah. Sending for a scan. Yeah, the scan. Fuck, I've, I've, sent, uh, I've sent a lot of people for MRIs recently in the last month. Mm. And as I was explaining to you today, it's always such a tough conversation to have with someone where, you know, you, you certainly want to... You want to advocate the, the urgency of why you want to get this imaging and the consequences, if not. But you also don't want them to feel really worried and scared, like, oh, shit, is it a fracture or what, like, really what's going on? And it's But expensive. sometimes they need to be concerned about that too, don't yeah, forget. Yeah, that's true, that's true. But you don't want to, you know, create unnecessary concern for it to come back clear because you can... Mm. And I probably have, I did have that happen once where I lost someone where, it, where I was like, this is probably this, we need mm. to get it scanned. And it come back and it was completely clear and they actually didn't come back. That was in my very first year. I haven't had that happen. That's the better of the two outcomes though, isn't it? That's true. Yeah. Like if it was that and you didn't send for it and it progressed, then that's worse. Yeah. Definitely. Starting to think that more where you, you know, if someone, if something happens and someone doesn't come back to see you and, you know, you feel as though you've done the right thing and done all Mm. the, the stuff that you need to do. You know, you you can't let it get you down too mm, much. However, I'm bad at that. Yeah. However, in saying that, it's not a cop out to be yeah. like, oh yeah, they just left. It's all their fault. It's not me. I'll, yeah. Yeah. And, I think, and more often than not, it's it's probably there's some reason for it. It's not because you're a bad clinician. Yeah. But some in some cases, it's worth following up. Following up. Reflect on that. Yeah. And I think we're pretty. And I've really enjoyed that. People, every we did the presentation. Sorry, I did the presentations for learning physio. And had a couple of messages come through about that they really enjoy it, which was was good, and they thought there was some good information. But they had never heard anyone advocate for the transparency of, of getting it wrong and being very humble, which mm. is the, which is the one thing we want to do with this podcast, with our Instagram, with all our socials. Is like this is what we think at the moment. Yeah. This is why. However nothing's certain and we certainly get it wrong but we try our best to get as close as we possibly can to the gold star knowing mm. that we actually never will get the gold star you're yeah. just always going for it yeah and we talk about that often like what sort of things have you changed recently and we'll say what we've like even from this course like some of the things that we're changing because of what we've recently learned mm. compared to what we were doing yeah. a week ago i was interested to find that foot tight wasn't a there was well, some research to say foot type is a risk factor but it wasn't that conclusive thought was interesting because yeah. in podiatry circles it's pretty pretty common knowledge that you know a flutter foot posture or a cavus foot may increase your, your risk and there was a, was a recent study that came out where they had two groups of females with bilateral shin pain one group got exercise massage and shockwave I think and another group got the same thing plus orthoses and the orthoses group did better mm. yeah I don't know I don't know 
Do you think that your practice would be different? Like, how you think of orthoses, do you not really think about them? Like, someone comes in with foot and ankle pain. What is the first thing that you think treatment-wise? That's a broad question. Yeah, but what generally, what do they need? Like, what do you think that they need? Or would, be, would Depends sorry, not in the need context. <clears throat> benefit from? Is it an acute injury? Is it a chronic injury? Chronic, chronic, chronic. Is it an Achilles? Just anything. It's a tendon. It's a, it's a perineal or a tip post. Perineal or tip po- tip post. I'm typically tip post. Tip post. I I am typically. Stop me under the table. Sorry. That sounded really aggressive. <laughs> You've been doing it on the whole podcast. Yeah, chill out. And it was a slight little <laughs> nudge. Because I put can't my handle up on... a little bump, eh? <laughs> I put my legs up on the chair and he kicked me off, and then anyway, yeah. Tip post and perineal. I'm I'm often thinking that a referral to you would be oh, good. No, I don't want you to say that. Why? I want you to tell me if I died, what would you do? If well, I... then I, I I usually would give them some sort of heel lift and strength work. Mm. Yeah. That's pretty much it. Yeah. What about a forefoot? Mm. Let's say you can't, like, what do you... I, I don't remember the last time I saw, saw someone with that came in with yeah. forefoot pain. Because it's funny the dynamic of if a patient comes in and I... What's like, great, you're this person sitting in front of me, what is in my tool belt to help? And I have been trained to think orthoses, but I don't think that. Mm. I think they need... Load eye tape. <laughs> my number one for, for most people, imagine like the pyramid down the bottom would be they need some load modification. Like I need to, if I had nothing else to give, I need to work out what their current loading is and have some way to quantify that. And then that needs to be either reduced or somehow modified. I mean, if you can modify the symptoms, though, then you might not have to. Yeah. I'm just thinking from like a pure, like, what's the first thing? And I'm trying to, to think of the dynamic between physio and podiatry and chiro. Like, if the same person with the exact same injury and saying everything came in, like, what do you go to first? Like, how are you minded to think? Mm. You know what I mean? So how do you think? So someone comes in with four foot pain, for podiatry, maybe, great, you need a lateral wedge orthotic with a met dome and you need taping and a rock and solid tree. Like, that's first line straight away. Whereas mm. if they come in to see you, what do you think that they need? So, like, maybe low guy, look at your load, that kind of thing. You know, what do you think? Interesting. And I'm, I'm happy to refer on also. I don't feel like I need to be jack of all trades. Like, if there's someone that's better out there for it than me, then mm. I'll just... Refer yeah. on, and I know in these hypothetical situations, then maybe there's other things that I do, but I don't live in that reality right now. Yeah. Well, I'm just trying to think for the people that listen, like perhaps they don't have the ability to refer on, but maybe they mm. do. But I just wanted to. But like, I, I and I guess this is because I we've spoken about it before, but like with a perineal, I'd do like a lateral, put them in like lateral so something, yeah. and then to post more medial support. Yeah. That's it. Do you think that if, let's say there was a course, right, a two-day course to learn how to do orthotics, do you think... I wouldn't do it. Yeah. You just, you don't think they would, they would help or any... I think they'd help. Yeah. I just don't want to do it. Yeah. I don't care about making orthotics. Yeah. Do you, and is that because you... Like, you obviously see them help. I mean, they've helped you when you've had them, and you still wear yours now and then, and you notice mm. a difference with your perineal. Like, if you if you knew that it would be... I also think changing your diet and eating better is beneficial for some people, but I don't want to be a dietitian. Yeah, but that's something that's a little bit different a weekend course compared to a four-year degree. Like, if you could... If you knew that it was going to help your patients and help get your patients better quicker... Would it be something that you would do? And the evidence was there. Same compared to, like, a course, a weekend of dry needling. Still no, because even logistically, getting the grinder and getting the equipment and the orthotics and all the glue and shit that you use, I don't... Like, logistically, that wouldn't happen in our clinic. Yeah, it's cool. I just... I don't think I've ever asked you that question. Mm. I just thought that would be be interesting. And it's just funny how the profession... Professors... (laughs) The professions are so, so different. Mm. Yeah, if funny. you could learn how to treat the shoulder, would you? Well, it wouldn't it wouldn't help me. But what does help me is learning more about strength and conditioning because that's an area where 
not all, but most pods from an undergraduate level don't have a lot of time to focus on because you've got other stuff to focus on. But it's like, that's where I need to put more of my time because I'm like, I, I can see a direct correlation with that helping. Mm. Mm. Yeah, same with like the footwear. And there was a weekend course on footwear, which you don't need. That's easier though. Yeah. I'd do that. that. Yeah, logistics of that. Mm. Yeah. One, I wrote this down in red and it was the only thing I wrote down from the weekend in red. I thought it was that good. <laughs> was taping someone, and this is in the context of their knee, but I'm thinking from a foot and ankle, taping someone lets them have more load, which is good. <laughs> because they can put more load through it. But then I added on in my own little spill, orthoses may be similar. Mm. So if I can give someone an orthotic with, let's say, a really cavus foot, no, a really flexible, planus, flatter foot posture, medial ankle pain, and they've done a lot of the good stuff, if I can chop them up with a medial wedge and they feel better and they can do more, that's good because they can load it more and perhaps mm. that's actually what gets them better and not the orthoses itself, but it's probably likely a combination of both. But I thought that was pretty cool and perhaps it's a, just confirming my own bias of like that is what I see clinically. Like yeah. I'll give someone something and they do come back and they're better and I'm like, it's just because you could do more with the same amount of pain yeah. or was it the orthoses actually <clears throat> unloaded the tissue and that's maybe it's just feeling better with less load through it. Mm. And, yeah, so the context that Rich was talking about it in was the McConnell's taping for patellofemoral pain. So, for example, you want to be loading someone's quads or um, doing quads, glutes, something. And if you can do a McConnell's tape and modify their symptoms and do a knee extension that's heavier or get that load higher, then typically they're going to do better for it. So, again, just emphasizing the importance of heavy load and, and that intensity being high and if you're the other thing that was a big sort of takeaway that I think I could apply more to my clinical practice is patients typic like patients get flared up from time to time. That's a guarantee. They will. They will get flared up. Yeah. If someone gets flared up and let's just narrow it to running injuries, but I've been thinking about it in the context of back pain as well over the last day um, of working since the course. Typically, it's not going to be the volume of your of your exercise. Uh, sorry, typically, it's not going to be the load. It's, it's more likely to be the volume. So what you want to be encouraging during rehab is keeping the intensity and the load high to have more of that impact on the, the tissues that you're trying to have an impact on. And don't worry so much about the volume. So, for example, instead of prescribing like three sets of eight, cut it back, do like three sets of five or even two sets of five, but make it really quality in those in those yeah. sets and, and reps. I think that was good Fuck, to know. Fuck, we should that at the start. That was good. Yeah. <laughs> the end. Anyway, now if you got to the end, we're going to finish it up there. If you got to the end... And that was only like two pages of the course. <laughs> I've still got like, we didn't even talk, we didn't touch yeah. on reds and low energy availability and yeah, bone shape and sports specialization. There was so much, there was so much good information through through the course. But that's that was probably the, I guess, the highlights because they were the main things that we brought up. <laughs> yeah. Now, if you got this far in, thank you for listening for 59 minutes. We want to reward you. Message us on the Instagram and we will give you a pair of Vaporfly 3 as we go into the draw. <laughs> but that's the end of the episode. Hope you enjoyed that. And find a good course this year mm. with someone that you trust and believe has good quality information. Make sure mm-hmm. it's in person. Make a bit of a trip out of it. Yeah. You can claim it all on tax, I'm pretty sure. Take the day off after. And yeah, go and meet someone that you you believe has good information and learn. And the other thing we didn't even touch on, it's great to network because you yeah. meet, we met Brad Beer, we Luke. met Luke, who's the nicest guy on earth. Yeah, yeah. so nice. He's a really good people. So great yeah, go down there and enjoy and have a good week.